Namaskritam naram jaiva narotamam devim sarasatim vyasam tito jayo jira nishta preshu vadvesu mityam bhagata seva bhagati utama shaki bhattu bhavati naishtaki nigama kaparu garitam param shukam karam itajo samyatam pivata bhagatam rashamariya mahora urusikabu kaum vishnu sadama bhagate damagini karona shtadi samasha parana kau dunavaditaham Chama Pihada Vishuddhi Vishuddha Mibhu Sama Pihada Yana Vidam Padaksaram Pagyahi Daho Mohara Jitatmaram Sankhlesha Nirvana Musanti Nanyadam Atmaram Astamonaya Nagaranti Hari Api Uru Kumangare Korvanti Hari Tiki Miram Itam Bhutam Ganahari Hey Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dina Bandhu Jigapate Gopesha Gopika Kantara Rikanta Namostate Jayatam Surito Pangava Mama Mandir Mandir Gati Matsava Shaparam Varjavarara Namayana Namayana Sri Man Rasa Rasa Rambi Vamsiva Karsan Panel Shanavaka Gopinata Sri Sanam Divya Brindaranya Kapadumada Sri Madratna Garashima Sanastam Sri Sri Radha Shidago in the Prestadavi Saiva Manush Marami Namo Brahmanya Devaya Go Brahmani Taya Chaja Gadi Taya Krishna Govinaya Namo Nama O Maganati Maranda Syangarangana Sadaka Chaksudan Miditam Yanatashma He Sigurveda Mount Sri Chaitanya Manubhishtam Shtapitam Yadabhutare Swayam Rupa Karamayam Dharati Swapanatikam He Krishna Karuna Sindhu Dhinu Vandu Jagapate Gopishaka Bhika Kandarat Karam Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sarigo Bhaktavindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare Sorry I'm a little late I ran across something on Facebook last night about large concrete and stone garden statues, Vishnu and Ganesh and Hanuman. We got uh, a wonderful Garuda, a big uh, stone statue of Garuda donated by Tota Gopinath. He's a Prabhupada disciple. We have been serving in the 80s in the Los Angeles temple together. He and his wife, uh, Brenda Davey, have been living in Utah for many years. In fact, they donated the original koi fish, uh, the descendants of which now populate our 200,000 gallon lake. Um, they're relocating to Colorado and there's some big sculptures that they didn't want to take with them. So um, we became the proud owners of the uh, quite large 36, I think, inches high Garuda statue, stone statue. By Bobby's inspired by the <laughs> Morty of Garuda to redo the whole aviary. She's had volunteers out there working for the last few days with new fencing and she's going to allow more sunlight in and Garuda's going to be out there as the patron saint of the parrots Pedro, Radha, and Ramu and he's going to be on a pedestal with his pranams and then facing Krishna in the at the altar. And then with all that going on I just started doing some Google searches about large quote-unquote Hindu concrete stone outdoor garden statues and apparently there's a big company in Oceanside California that imports gigantic pieces they're not cheap but they will definitely be uh, tourist attractions and conversation pieces for people that come onto the property what do you think about that Thomas you're into hospitality and reception and attracting people to the Krishna temple. Do you think that would be something worth pursuing? Yeah, I think it's great. Uh, especially if we had some little kind of uh, plaque or info, you know, at the base of each that tells what they are. I think it's a great way to introduce them to a whole a cornucopia of characters that are part of our religion, you know, our faith. So that's awesome. Particularly in India, you can be wandering somewhere in the jungle, you know, miles away from any villages and turn a corner and there's a huge statue of Hanuman and uh, even though it's out in the middle of nowhere people visit in the hundreds they apply kum kum to his feet and to his ankles and consider uh, it's a very very auspicious integral part of their day when they can get the darshan of Hanuman so I think a Hanuman deity out there somewhere we don't have any monkeys but uh, anyway <laughs> I think that would be also a great um, addition to the to the property. Good morning, Govinda Dave. Uh, good morning, Rakesh, Brent, Thomas. What do you think? What are you thinking this morning? Are you back from Arizona, Rob? 
I am. I got back uh, yesterday evening. What part of Arizona were you in? Phoenix. Okay. Yeah, there's a temple in Phoenix. There's a really charming facility in Tucson. Thomas just got back from there. In fact, you, both of you were in Arizona at approximately the same time. But, uh, Thomas uh, posted some nice pictures of the Tucson. What, what new things are in the works down there at Tucson by the dynamic preacher and innovator Sandamani? Kind of a kindred spirit to me and by Bobby. Yeah, she reminds me a lot of, of the two of you. She has that pioneer mood and always thinking big. Yeah, they're building a, a beautiful Krishna house for senior devotees to get care. It's going to be able to hold, I think, 10 to 12 devotees that will need some kind of assisted living care. That's just... Um, a block or two away from the temple. And then they bought a big piece next to them. They're a little bit landlocked right there in Tucson, but they've been able to buy up some property for a larger temple. And they've got 20, 25 devotees living there on the property. So they've got some wonderful uh, devotees from Nepal. And then they've got um, some disciples of Prabhupada and then uh, half a dozen younger devotees who are new to Krishna consciousness in the last uh four to six years that are living there. So it's, it's great. And a very popular restaurant there. It's the number one vegetarian restaurant in Tucson. As long as I've known Sandamani, she's been known for being an excellent cook and probably she doesn't cook herself that much, but I know that she would, uh, you know, if she's going to bring cooks on board, she's going to make sure that they're the best that they could possibly be. So I'm so glad whenever I hear about successes in Tucson, I feel like that's in a way our success too, and vice versa. She's our well-wisher, and she's always posting encouraging things on the uh, internet. Speaking of art, garden art, by Bobby um, posted a few days ago some pictures of her latest art endeavor, um, Radha and Krishna. And, oh my gosh, I think they've, they're up to 120 and I'm not going to say likes. I'm not going to say comments. I'm going to say 120 shares. 120 people who received that shared it. So it's just uh, mind-boggling how widely these pictures have been circulated. And uh, when she does that, she asks for comments, how it could be improved. I've only seen one comment uh, about how it could be improved. And as soon as that comment was made, about five people shot that person down. <laughs> so there is pretty much universal approval for the current endeavors of Bai Bobby. The only downside is that uh, she doesn't, she's been working on those for over a year now. And, you know, it'd go for weeks and she won't have any time at all to spend on those paintings. It is my fondest hope that some or other uh, she, she would be free with what time there is left remaining in this lifetime to devote yourself full time to painting. I feel like we're all, the whole world is missing out when Bai Bobby has to attend to minor, minor details in the temple with others. I mean, it seems to me there, there would be devotees that could take care of things in such a way that Bai Bobby would be free to exercise her incredible talent, but that, that seems to be hoping for too much. <laughs> anyway. I'm not going to stop hoping anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, um, Thomas says we need to figure out how to make glisse. Is that the right spelling? G-L-I-C-E. Never heard of that word. Prints. Other devotees work sell for two to four hundred dollars a piece. Yeah, and we've got to set her up a Patreon page too. Uh, several people actually asked, does she have a Patreon page uh, through which I could? Thomas says G-I-C. G-I-C-L-E-E. -E. Well, that's a new word for me. Thank you so much. Yeah, we need to support Bai Bobby to the highest degree that we possibly can. She does so much. Uh, I mean, it's nothing's menial for Krishna. Everything is on the highest level. But considering what she could be doing and what she could leave to future generations, it's kind of a shame that there isn't more help up here. But anyway... Enough boohooing. Let's go to speaking of boohoo. I think anybody who has to undergo the constant struggle, changing their body, should be in a boohoo mood and think about what they can do to change that. Uh, Krishna is uh, 
Krishna is making us an offer that we shouldn't refuse. You know, in this life, what to speak of reincarnating future lives, what to speak of the time, said that for Paranjana, after spending a, a lifetime totally absorbed in his wife, his kids, his bodily concern. You know, obviously he was a king, so he ate well. He had cooks preparing special food for longevity. He might have had a gym in the palace. He practiced martial arts. He had probably masseurs and manicurists and a special regal barber. Who knows? He had everything that one could possibly want for his body. And yet that time inevitably comes, which is not looked forward to by the attached materialists. Yuktishu evam paramatasha. Paramatasha means those who are mad after sense gratification, which comes through. Stuyasmituni bhav my tongue. Sex life, wife, children, land, expansion of influence, expansion of power. Um, those who become totally absorbed of in those things to the exclusion of the higher calling of self-realization. Uh, for them, the time of death is totally anathema. So they haven't prepared for it. They haven't thought about it. On one level, they've deluded themselves that while ahani ahani bhutani gachanche omniyam, everybody else has died every single moment. There are hundreds of thousands of living entities leaving their bodies and going to the abode of Lamaraj, being so much absorbed in materialistic accumulation and family affairs. One somehow or other puts it out of his mind, thinking that, well, everybody else has died, but I'll be an exception. If I can just put this much money in the bank or add so many more rooms into the house or upgrade to this kind of a car or work out in the gym or take this hormonal supplement, then I will, I may, I, I may die eventually, but it's still a long way off. You know? I, at least I won't die today. But what to speak of that totally traumatic event of having to be kicked out of the current body and who knows where you're going to go. Imagine being in a dark cliff. You can't see the hand in front of your face. And you know there's a huge pit in front of you and you don't want to step into it uh, because it's full of uh, unknowns. It's full of terror. It's full of, uh, you, know, you don't know what it is. And uh, and you you want you don't want to step into it, and yet at the same time there's someone behind you, pushing you over the edge, and you topple and fall head over heels. Where you're going to end up, what your next situation, what next, what the next womb that you're going to find yourself in, you 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 don't know. What to speak of that? And that's obviously troublesome. Does anybody want to change their body? Does anyone want to grow old? Does anybody want to die? I think we can all agree that this is not something we would choose if we had our preferences. You know, it's certainly a, the last thing that we would wish for. But the same thing is happening in a less dramatic, a less painful way, even during our life. The struggle for existence means it boils down to this, that you have to always change from one position to another. And whenever you change, there's adaptation, there's a learning curve, there's discomfort, there's pain to get to the next level or to adapt from boyhood to youth and then to old age. We have to change from being a toddler. As I said yesterday, it's a huge endeavor to learn how to walk in our next birth. Uh, and then after learning how to walk in the next compulsion, society encourages you uh, you're incited to learn how to run. You have to become an athlete. You have to develop muscles. You have to develop coordination. And it's such a long process. When we're spastic, we say and do things that we hadn't intended to do. We don't have control of our, our words, of our tongue, of our uh, body. And finally, we get to an age where we have some grace, some beauty. And what's the first thing that happens? We notice the girls. Oh, boy. And the girls start noticing us. And uh, we're off and running. <laughs> we're off and running. The first 20 years of our life we spend in sports, 
trying mightily to achieve grace and co uh, coordination to feel ourselves um, comfortable, to feel that we have a place, a niche, we have friends, we have grades, we have the approval of our parents. We have to do so much to get that. And then as soon as we arrive at a place where we feel pretty good about ourselves, then we notice the girls. And we notice that the girls are noticing us. And there you go. There's another 40 years at least of your life. Do it put in a comment. Comment means lust. Lust rears its ugly head. And we're off and running. We All we can think about is the girls and the girls are all just thinking exclusively of the boys and we can't we can't wait until we get a girlfriend and then we can't wait till we get married and then the price of marriage is big mortgage car payments children uh, one two children with a third children you have to upgrade to a, a minivan you've got three different schools three different soccer practices three different sets of clothes at different sizes <clears throat> constantly adapting from boyhood to youthhood to studenthood <clears throat> to courting to dating to age dating the body that you're dating in to the body of a husband and a father and a, a businessman or a worker an employee or an employer and then finally you get to that uh, time of life where there are the signs of old age beginning to manifest themselves and one who's intelligent should try to then back out of that dark alley of family life. One should not approach death with considerations of family affairs in one's mind. Because the result is that will cause you to take birth again in another family. So how much trouble there is in terms of giving up one body and assuming another body, in terms of all the seasonal and bodily and physical and anatomical and mental changes that we go through. Wouldn't it be nice? Wouldn't it be nice to get your original eternal body and not have to change it anymore, not have to adapt it anymore to different seasons, different temperatures, different climates, different living conditions, different employments, different bosses, different mandates, different dictates, Imagine the only body you had was your eternal spiritual body and the only employment that you had to undergo was to love God through your bona fide access to spiritual masters. Imagine that we didn't have to do all the things that we have to do that we didn't have to run down our to-do list every single day, but that the to-do list basically said one thing each and every day, and we simply had to give deeper and deeper and deeper and get more and more relish from that. The to-do list is love Krishna according to the instructions and guidance of your of your spiritual master. How how easy and simple life would be. How the hard struggle for existence would immediately begin to subside. This material nature is insurmountable. It's God's divine energy. It's far more powerful than we are. Imagine being dropped down in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You might be a great swimmer. You might be one of those guys that have swum across the English Channel. But you cannot swim across the Pacific Ocean. It's far beyond your power. So each and every one of us have been dropped into this ocean of birth, death, disease, and old age. And we need to, we can't get out on our own. We need to take the lifeline, take the shelter which is being offered to us by the parampara, the disciplic succession. Otherwise, it's simply a life of hard struggle for material existence. The only uh, escape hatch from which is to take shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and through having the lotus feet of the Lord. So Arjuna has a doubt. He hears many of these points laid out by his good friend, Lord Krishna. He has a doubt. He puts it to Lord Krishna. Well, Krishna, it sounds good. Um, 
I'm inspired to start my spiritual journey, take those steps and make those permanent changes that I need to make in order to devote myself to my supreme creator and my loving father, the Lord, and become an instrument um, for doing his will in this world. But what if the Mudo, you know, we're infinitesimal. We got here in the first place because we got some wrong ideas. We took some wrong turns. Um, so, uh, you know, that's we're prone to that. And so what if I embark upon the path, make some progress, and then some or other due to unfortunate circumstances or past bad habits, I cease and desist. And will I not have wasted time, the time that I spent pursuing spiritual goals, will that not have been time that I could have been spending, you know, getting a big salary, sharpening my um, horrible, uh, employable skills, climbing the corporate ladder? Uh, will I not have, will I not be behind then in the rat race if I, takes time out for spiritual life and then uh, come back to the whole thing two or four or six years later. Krishna says, no, don't worry about that. He says, he says, Kachin no, well, Arjuna's imagery is actually a little haunting too. He says, would I not be like a riven cloud which has no position in the sphere? You see a big fluffy cloud in the sky and as you watch it, a little segment of that cloud sort of somehow or other drifts away from the main body of cloud and as soon as it becomes separated it becomes less and less substantial less and less visible more and more ephemeral and that wisp of cloud before your very eyes disappears so it's not it does it hasn't gotten any shelter separately and it has lost the shelter of the overall mass of clouds and therefore Arjuna's imagery here is very good it says does one who starts the spiritual path, lose time in the material rat race, then gives up spirituality in order to return to the material. Does he not have, does he have, does he, I don't know exactly how to phrase it. How do I say that, Thomas? Does he not have a position in any sphere? In other words, he's neither here nor there. Uh, what, 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 what's the answer to this conundrum, Krishna? And Krishna says, Nahabrikama Nasasi Pratyavai even a small bit of advancement on this path saves one from the greatest danger. And Krishna encourages us. He's not insisting on perfection. He's just asking that we have a heart right, that we want in our heart of hearts to serve the Lord, and we keep moving forward. We don't have to be perfect. It says, even if one performs actions which by society's measures and standards are called abominable, actions for which one is severely criticized, still one is to be considered saintly because he is rightly situated. doesn't matter what people say about you. doesn't matter whether you have people's approval or not. doesn't matter whether you conform to the mores of the culture as long as you have God's approval. God's approval is all we need. God is the source of our promotion. God is the source of our provision. God is the source of blessing and favors. People can't promote you. People can't bless you. People can't favor you unless and until they're moved by the Supreme Lord from within the heart to befriend you, to sponsor you, and to patronize you. So it, if one is a devotee, even a neophyte devotee, even a devotee that still is full of mistakes, misconceptions, at least one is no longer on the level of the foolish cow or the ass. At least one knows that one is not this body, that the purpose of life, the summum bonum of life, is to engage in the service of the Lord under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master and to Break free of the bondage of illusory attachments. This is, this is, this means indicates that one has started one's journey, back to home, back to God. You want to throw in anything here, Rob or Thomas? Oh, Thomas says he lost his power. He's listening on the phone. Cool. All right, Rob. Uh Yes, Prabhuji. I'm I'm reminded of a phrase that has stuck with me for for a while, and I was encouraging. But perfection is a direction, 
not a destination. Oh, wonderful. That's, and that's helped me through. Perfection is a direction, not a destination. I'm going to write that down. Perfection is a direction, not a destination. Great. I remember one time in Australia, I'd arranged an interview with Prabhupada on some television station. And the uh, interviewer asked Prabhupada, said, you know, it was, the, it was the 70s. He said, there are so many protest groups in the streets nowadays. There are the civil rights protesters marching in the streets with their banners and their slogans. There are the anti-Vietnam War protesters marching the streets with their slogans, their chants, and all black power people marching. There are the you know, there were even communists in, in, in Australia then, active communists who would march with the sickle and hammer. And he said the Hare Krishnas are also out there. And you've got your banners and you've got your slogans. So some are protesting Vietnam War, some are protesting uh, white supremacy, some are protesting civil rights. What are the Hare Krishnas protesting? Prabhupada said, we are protesting death. We are protesting death. When you think about it, the animal doesn't think about death. The animal's not aware of death. The animal doesn't plan for death. Death takes the animal so, totally by surprise. The animal doesn't even know what is death. But the human being, we can understand that we have a short lifespan, that what has started will come to an end. We see the signs and the symptoms of the body aging. Old age is called the yellow light. Before the light turns red at the intersection, It'll go from green, it'll go from yellow, and the yellow is a warning. You better slow down, you better stop, because everything is going to come to a halt here uh, up ahead. So when we get those aches and pains, and when our memory is not as good as it used to be, and it becomes wrinkles at the corners of our eyes and crow's feet, that's a sign from God and through material nature that we better wind up our material affairs, extract ourselves from the family entanglement, and prepare to meet the Lord, hopefully. Prepare to leave this body and to create an ideal situation for serving the Lord in the next life. Prabhupada said, the problem is not eating, the problem is not sleeping, the problem is not mating, the problem is not defending. We've manufactured so many problems in this conditioned, material, forgetful state of God. We've Lost sight of the fact that our real problem is we are eternal. We should be asking ourselves, why should I have to die? Tato, Brahma, Jignash. The animals do not ask themselves that question. But once one has achieved the rare and valuable human form of life, the symptom of one's humanity, the symptom of one's not only just having received a human body, but of one's human consciousness having been awakened, the symptom is a tato brahma jignashi. Now I've got this human form of body. Now I need to inquire what is my main problem and how to solve it. The main problem is that you have to leave this body. That this body is constantly changing. Every seven to ten years, all the cells of the body die and are replaced by new. So even within a, a single lifetime, say 80 years, you've had eight or nine or ten complete changes of body, changes of mind, perhaps change of residence, change of beliefs, change of relatives, change of inner circle, change of employment, change of priorities. How can I solve this constant harassment of changing? We get a good bit of advice from Yamaraj, the Lord of Death. He's the one that has to receive all the people who didn't capitalize on the human form of life. All the failures go to Yamaraj for dispensation, for judgment. <laughs> if you don't achieve the lotus feet of Krishna, you're going to go to Yamaraj. Now, Yamaraj is, you know, he doesn't like to see souls coming in for punishment. And he gives them such advice that, they, that this can be the last time that you come to see Yamaraj and get assigned another material body. So what does Yamaraj say to those souls who missed it, who didn't make it this time around? What, what advice does he send them back into the material with, uh, following which they could make the next birth the very, very last birth? This is what he says. Evam bunrishya shudhyo bhagavati anante. Sarvatma bidatri kalu bhama yogam. 
Tilme na dandam arhanti ata yadi amisham. Yamaraj often has a stick with which he punishes those who missed it in the human form of life, who wasted the uh, potential of the human form of life and pursued the same pleasures as the cats and dogs. Nate na dandam. He says, if you want to avoid my rod of punishment, shapatatam tadapi hanti. Urugaya, Urugaya means not pleasant. The abode of Yamaraj is not a resort. It's not a all-inclusive vacation spot. It's not Cancun. It's not Cabo. It's not Acapulco. It is Urugaya. It is a ghastly place which you should try to avoid at all costs. So considering these points, Yamaraj says, therefore, intelligent men decide Read my lips to solve all problems, to solve all problems, birth problem, disease problem, old age problem, death problems. Intelligent men decide to solve all problems. How? And you should be all ears right now. You should be, you should be so keen to hear what follows. The method that Yamaraj, the Lord of Death himself, is recommending by which we solve the birth problem, death problem, disease problem, and all being. And this is his answer by adopting devotional service, loving devotional service, LDS, loving devotional service of the Lord by chanting his holy names, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ram Rama. There is no more effective, quick, or easy process to extricate oneself from all miseries than chanting the holy names of the Lord. Why is it so easy? Because the Lord is your well-wisher. He's situated in your heart. Savasya chaham ridi shani vishto matash mitir gyanam aponam cha. From him come knowledge, remembrance, or forgetfulness. So as soon as you reach out to the Lord by chanting his holy names, the Lord awakens knowledge, the innate primeval knowledge of the Lord. He brings it to light. He brings it to the surface. He revives it from within the heart. And as much as the Lord is a mine of all auspicious qualities, Aishriya, Shamagrasya, Viryasha, Yasya, Sriya, Dhyana, Vairagya, Chapi, Sharam, Bhagamitinga. The Lord is a source of all wealth, all fame, all opulence, all knowledge, all beauty, and all humility. When we associate with the Lord through sound vibration, by chanting his holy names, we also tap into an unlimited reservoir of intelligence of spiritual beauty, of creativity. We become blessed, we become prosperous, we become wise, we become insightful, we become capable of deep, meaningful, uh, sweet, relational uh, activities. And importantly, the bewilderment, the illusion of identification with this material body and the consequent performance of sinful acts to promote, to protect, and to elevate this body and the extensions of this body in terms of family, friends, and country, those go away. Just like the fog is dissipated by the morning sun. All these desirable results are achieved when one begins to chant, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna tells Arjuna, he says that the key in the fourth chapter, ninth verse, Transcendental knowledge. Krishna says to Arjuna, the key is simply this. Simply this. It's, it's not difficult, unlike all the things that we have to do, all the changes we have to make, all that we have to put up with, all the inconveniences of changing a material body one after another. Unlike that, totally differentiated from it and distinct from the troublesome pass of material maintenance, all we have to do to solve our problems of life, Krishna says, is Janma Karma Medhikyam in Yotapya Chakra Deham Purna Medhi Mamriti Hajana. Krishna says to Arjuna, one who knows the transcendental nature, Janma Karma Medhikyam, transcendental nature of my birth and my activities, Evam Yoveti Tattaraha. Tattara means you need to know it in truth. You need to know it. From the Lord Himself. Who can best explain themselves than the person themselves? We shouldn't speculate on the likes and dislikes, the preferences of some other person. 
we really want to know what that person likes, and if we really want to know what pleases them, we need to just ask them. We need to hear from them. What pleases you? What do you like? I don't want to give you what I like, because it because what I like may not be what you like. Krishna says, Patram Pushpam Palam Teum Yomi Bhakti Tadish Krishna says the Supreme Personality of God here. It's no big deal. Just offer me a flower, fruit, leaf, water, milk, grains, fruits, vegetables, and I will accept them. He assures us in advance that he'll accept simple offerings of flower, fruit, leaf, or water. The Supreme Personality of God is so easily pleased. All we have to do is understand how it is that his birth and activities are not ordinary. How it is that although he's within history, he's not a byproduct of the modes of material nature. He's not, uh, his body is not generated from goodness, passion, and ignorance. A Job he shunned. He is unborn, he's eternal, he's imperishable, he's ever existing. But due to his kindness and his mercy, he's descended and revealed his original Shyam Bhagavan spiritual form amongst conditioned, suffering, and living beings to encourage us, to entice us, to whet our appetites, to get with the program, engage in his devotional service, and go back to home, back to God. All you have to do in order to understand in truth the transcendental nature of Krishna's birth and activities is to hear from the proper source. Who can best describe the beloved than the lover? And the whole process of devotional service is hearing from the lover about the beloved. Radharani says, oh, I'm the same Radha, and this is the same Krishna, uh, and we're meeting in Kurukshetra, um, uh, but, but it's not the same. Krishna, I want to be back in Vrindavan on the banks of the Yamuna River hearing the notes of your flute. I want to go back to that time in our youth when all I had was you and all you had was me. When we saturate ourselves, when we absorb ourselves, and take, uh, put ourselves under the shower of the nectary, heartfelt prayers of such as Srimati Radharan, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, then that dormant love of God awakens from within our hearts. As soon as love of God replaces the lusty material desires of this world, then the result is chakva deham pranarnei janma neti mamara. Upon leaving this current body, you do not take another material body. You're not pushed into that dark cave and over a cliff into that dark pit. Who's chanting the names of the Lord whose eyes are opened, anointed with the salve of love. He sees very clearly, initially, the difference between spirit and matter. He also sees that as a spiritual being, he's not God. He's not all-powerful. He is Jiva Shuru Bahai Nitya Krishna As Krishna Tathasta Shakti Beta Beta Prakas. That we are qualitatively one with the Lord in so far as we eternal full of bliss and knowledge, but quantitatively we're small. God is great. Our eternal position is to render loving devotional service under him with the very very best of our abilities let me just turn off the beeps here <clears throat> arjuna says to krishna that we are the same in one sense we are the same a devotee and the lord are the same uh, uh, but at the same time they're different as well tamevam vidit patpa maritumeti nanyam panta vidite yanayam one can attain the perfect stage of liberation from birth and death. The Lord is always above the vicissitudes of this material world. Even when he comes here, he's not affected by matter. He's immune from birth, death, disease, and old age. He is the all-powerful source of everything, entering within his creation on a mission of mercy to enlighten and rescue his parts and parcels who themselves have fallen into this material ocean of birth and death disease and old age. Now those part and parcels of the Lord, being qualitatively one with the Lord, can revive their original God consciousness. They can restore and reconstitute themselves simply by knowing the Lord. There is no other way to achieve this level of protection. On the other hand, one who does not understand 
that Krishna is none other than the Supreme Personality of God, one who is misled by unscrupulous or uninformed commentators to think that Krishna is an ordinary man or a historical personality or that Krishna is allegorical. If one is unfortunate enough to uh, follow uh, unschooled, undevotionalized leaders like that, all one can do is lick the outside of the bottle of the jar of honey. You lick the glass. By licking the glass, you'll never know what is the taste of the honey inside the glass. So interpreting, interpolating the Bhagavad Gita according to mundane scholarship or one's own agenda. Gandhi is called Mahatma, certainly a great man in so many respects, but his commentary of the Bhagavad Gita, he says, I do not think Krishna ever existed. I do not think the Kurukshetra War ever took place. I think it's just an allegory. It's an allegory, the conclusion of which is to exercise nonviolence. Of course, Bhagavad Gita is about nonviolence. It is about the difference between the soul and the body and how we can act uh, in a nonviolent way uh, according to the highest level of behavior. But there was a battle. There was blood flow. There were uh, souls that left their bodies. It's not that the battle of Kurukshetra did not take place. But one must be very careful to hear about the Lord from the right source, not from speculators, not from people who have a political agenda or have their own philosophical point of view and want to ride on the coattails of the Bhagavad Gita. These may be very important people in the material world. One commentator on the Bhagavad Gita, Dr. Radhakrishna, was a, a powerful intellect, respected all over the world for his uh, intellect, for the books that he wrote. So great an intellectual was he that he was elevated to be the vice president of India, and he served many, many terms as the vice president of India. He, he was not in politics. He had no political expertise, but his stature as a scholar was so great. He was so widely known and respected that he was made the vice president of India, and yet in his commentary of the Bhagavad Gita, when it comes to the verse Manmana Bhava Madhaki Madhyake, Mam Mana Madhakta Madhyake Mamna, four times Krishna says in the first two verses, first two lines, four times he says, To me, to me, to me, to me. Think of me, become my devotee, bow down for me and offer me. And then Priya Pino Shri Me, and you will definitely come to me. And this scholar says that it is not to the personal Krishna to which one must surrender. It is not to the personal Krishna to which one must bow down. Not to the personal Krishna one must think or offer one's obeisance to the impersonal within Krishna. That scholar, who is world famous for his intellectual, um, unfortunately offended the Supreme Lord and his devotees to such an extent that he spent the last 20 years of his life with cerebral thrombosis, living in a wheelchair, unable to even care for himself. So don't go that way. Don't follow in that line of disability succession, which will simply lead you into darkness. We are warned, said Kama Nupuna Vipro Mantra Tanta Visha, Avaishnava Guru Nasyat Vaishnava Shapacha Guru. It says, said Karma Nupuna Vipro, even if one is expert in doing the rituals of Karma Kanda and is uh, knowledgeable, conversant with all the philosophy of the Vedas, Viprona Vipro, Mantra Tanta Vipro, can chant all the mantras expertly, much better than some less educated devotees. It says, still, Abhaishnava Guru said, he cannot become a leader of men. One should not follow such a person because he is not a Vaishnava, he is not expert. Though he may be expert in so many mundane subjects, if one is not expert in the science of Krishna consciousness, one should not accept such a person as a leader. However, even a person born in a lower caste can become a spiritual master if he's Krishna conscious. Yadi Deke Tari Ko Krishna says, wherever you can find a devotee, wherever you can find someone who's chanting Hare Krishna and is hooked up in the bona fide line of this succession, then you also take shelter of that person's lotus feet. You also hook up with the Supreme Lord through that lifeline of disciplic succession. Don't hesitate. Do it immediately. It's a once in a many, many lifetime 
opportunity by hooking yourself up to the right teacher, uh, going all the way back up to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you will end up adopting, internalizing, realizing the principles of devotional service, which are enunciated by the Lord himself in the Bhagavad Gita. It will make your life perfect and make a permanent solution to all the problems of life. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna Hari 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 Ram Hari Ram 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 Hari Hari. Not bad way to end our uh, threesome of sessions this week by solving all the problems of life. That's an upbeat way to end up if I ever heard of one. You have any more pithy contributions, Rob? What What was the last one? Direction? What is it? What did you say? Something is perfection is direction. Yes. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, perfection is a direction, not a destination. Okay. Super. You can you make a couple more comments while I write that down? Um, it's all about progress, not perfection. Ah, another good. Um, and, and remembering that we have no diminution in our progress. So yeah, any progress yeah. we, we make, we get to hold on to. Um, that's That's been an important one for me because I always feel I'm falling short and not doing as well as I should, but to be reminded that it is the, it is the progress that is, that is most important. You know, whatever work I do in this life will, will be contributed towards my next life and my position will be, um, much better and more conducive to to nurturing my loving devotional service for Krishna. Exactly. I was in a household of someone who lost a, a loved one at a young age in his 40s who passed away. And I was visiting with some of the relatives last week and the older brother during the course of our conversation, he's been brought up America yet. Even though he's Indian, he, he knows nothing about uh, Bhagavad Gita. So he was asking some very elementary questions. At one point, he came out with a stunning statement. He says, I just go around feeling like I'm damned. He says, do you think Krishna can forgive me? So I thought about that. I said, I don't, I don't think Krishna has to forgive you. I think Krishna just really wants to see you moving forward. He doesn't like to see you regressing. He doesn't like to see you making bad decisions and then compounding them. He doesn't approve of any of that, but... I'm not sure that the issue of God forgiving us is really germane. It's it's up to us to get back on track and begin to make spiritual progress. Maybe we need to forgive ourselves. I don't know about that, but I don't know about God needing to forgive us. You know, uh, there's also the point that there's nothing we can do that hurts God. We may hurt God's creatures. We may act in such a way as to set them back or retard them in their spiritual journey. And that's certainly not um, good, not a good thing to do. Uh, we may want to, at least in our heart, ask forgiveness from those whom we've wronged. Uh, but uh, I'm not sure that God has been hurt himself by anything that we do. And therefore we don't need to ask God's forgiveness. We just need to do what he would like us to do, which is to, clean up our act, get rid of some bad habits, start making moves in the right direction. Perfection is not a destination, it's a direction. God wants us back. It's not a question of forgiving or not forgiving or whether you're going to hell or whether you're not going to hell. Um, God doesn't put us into hell, we put ourselves into hell by living all guilty and all condemned. Who hasn't made mistakes? Some of us graver mistakes than others that's true but you're still a member of god's family you're still uh, you still have god's blood flowing in your veins you're still sons and daughters of royalty and so we need to we need to throw off all this guilt and condemnation and uh, and get on get on about the joyful business of awakening our krishna consciousness learning about krishna and truth and thus preparing ourselves not to have to come back again and take another material body. My Bobby says, some very nice comment, it doesn't matter how far you've gone or how fast you're going, the most important thing is to be going in the right direction. 
Yeah. Govinda wants a comment from you, Thomas, if you've regained your sound. Govinda wants you to comment on this feeling, the feeling damned. He says, isn't that a Catholic thing? He also has another comment here. He says, repentance isn't dwelling in guilt. It's changing direction. I don't know if T Thomas has got his sound problems solved yet, but we'd love to have your feedback here. Okay, I think Thomas lost. He lost connection. All right. Anyway, very good discussion. Thank you for your earlier comments, Thomas. Thank you twice for jumping in very appropriately there, Rob. Uh, Govinda joined us. Brent, Rakesh, of course, Thomas and Rob by Bobby. Uh, Gary. Thank you. Who else? Mahatma, Jaiho, Jean, Shrukshma, Raquel. How do you vote, Raquel? Who else? That's about it. Comment. Let me know because I did notice on my picture on the side it's kind of like buffering quite often today. I'm wondering how many of you had that experience and how distracting it was. I really like these backgrounds, which you guys. I can't get in Facebook Live. I mean, isn't this nice? It's nice for me to sit here with the t temple just over my shoulder. And um, if we go to Facebook Live, I'm just not sure we can have all this wonderful backgrounds. But and, and at the same time, if we're losing listeners, if it's too distracting, it's too annoying, then we'll have to go to Facebook Live. So I'd like your opinion and your feedback on that, if you don't mind. That's it. We had Motivational Monday, Transcendental Tuesday, and I think you'll all agree a lot of a lot of wisdom on this Wednesday session. So we'll see you again with the same series of shows, Bhagavatam shows, starting again, resuming, taking up again next Monday. We have our weekend talks as well, Saturday night in Salt Lake City and Sunday in Spanish Fork. In the meantime, there's so many wonderful speakers. There's so many resources to keep your Krishna consciousness alive and burning, to keep yourself moving in the right direction. Armarendra, Chaitanya Charan, Garanga, Radha Radhikarama, just goes on and on, Sutapa, Garanga Darshan. It's like, there are so many choices out there. Um, and we can be thinking of Krishna all day long by the grace of the great souls who are further along the path than us. So please take advantage of all that there is in the human form of life. You never know. This is a place where there's danger at every step. So always be in a state of preparedness. Always be absorbed in Krishna consciousness. Always remember Krishna and never forget. That's our rule of thumb. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare.